This is the part two video for the chapter 13 lecture. Last time we started out with the endocrine system. And before we jump into the rest of this chapter, I wanted to again just remind you to make sure you watch the entire video because there's going to be four videos that you're going to have to watch for a grade. You'll get five points for watching each of those. It's not extra credit, it's an assignment. Um, so that's a total of 20 points. And then also I'll be telling you about a case study that you'll be doing in instead of a lab for this chapter. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you guys. So last time we talked about um, some basics of the endocrine system. And I'm not going to completely go over everything, um, but remember we talked about the difference between the endocrine and exocrine systems. Remember the endocrine system releases hormones into the bloodstream, where the exocrine system secretes a product into a tube or a duct that delivers their products to a specific place. Okay, so we talked about a couple of um, different um, endocrine glands like the pituitary, the posterior and anterior pituitary. Um, but I wanted to start here on this slide. We've already finished this one, but I wanted to jump back here um, and just introduce today's lecture from this point. Okay, so um, we talked last time about how negative feedback controls helps regulate um, hormone production, right? We, we talked about we don't want these huge swings um, in responses and we don't want huge swings in hormones. We wanna keep things um, very close to where we want the average concentration in the blood, okay? So here we're looking at an example of how negative feedback works, but this example is going to be looking at how the thyroid works. And that's the first endocrine organ we're gonna pick up today. Um, but remember the hypothalamus is kind of the control center of the brain for most processes. Hypothalamus is going to release thyrotropic releasing hormone. That hormone is gonna tell the anterior pituitary, hey, time to release thyroid stimulating hormone. It's gonna to go to the blood travel all throughout the body, but when the, it intercepts with the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland then is going to produce its hormones. We said those were T3, T4, and then also calcitonin is another one. And that's going to have some effects on the target cells. And we'll talk about what those are here in just a little bit, okay? And then those levels will then kind of do the negative feedback thing and turn off the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary signals. Okay, so this is just kind of an introduction to um, remind you that the hypothalamus a lot of times will control the anterior or sometimes the posterior pituitary. And then that gland, um, either one of those glands will then control, remember a peripheral gland, and in this case it's the thyroid. So if we jump up to where we left off, to this slide here talking about the thyroid gland. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it. So the thyroid, if you can recognize this structure, do you remember what this is? The trachea and the larynx or the voice box. And the thyroid's gonna sit just right underneath the larynx and right at the top of the trachea. Um, one thing that it does besides act as an endocrine gland is remove iodine from the blood and um, help with iodine metabolism in the body, okay? There are three hormones that the thyroid produces. T3, which is thyroxine, T4, which is thyroxine, T3, triodothyronine, and then also calcitonin. Um, Calcitonin helps regulate blood calcium, and these two are going to be um, having effects on blood, I shouldn't say blood, um, glucose metabolism. And calcitonin helps regulate blood calcium levels. 
Now, if we look at the thyroid microscopically and we look at the individual cells, we have what's called a colloid, which is this inner area here. That's a place where the hormones can be stored in that colloid region. The follicular cells produce T3 and T4. Okay, so that's where those hormones are going to be produced. And then calcitonin is produced by the extra follicular cells. So the ones a little bit farther away. And I'll show you this next slide. This makes it, I think, a little bit more clear. So here's the colloid where the hormones are stored. The follicular cell, T3, T4 production. And then the extra follicular. Remember, extra means kind of outside of or away from. Um, these are kind of away from the colloid. They're a little bit farther away. That's where the calcitonin is going to be produced. Okay, now thyroid hormones are um, like T3 and T4 are going to be used to help with increasing the rate of carbohydrate metabolism. Okay, so T4 does that. T3 is just more potent than T4. Okay, so the anterior pituitary, which is going to be controlled by the hypothalamus, is going to detect a need to increase the rate of carbohydrate metabolism. Okay, like for instance, glucose metabolism. T thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, is going to be sent down to the thyroid to release. Uh, T4 and T3. And those two hormones are going to um, cause the breakdown of carbohydrates for energy. And also um, using proteins for energy, it's going to speed up growth and stimulate the nervous system. Okay, so those are some of the actions of T3 and T4. And remember, they come from the thyroid. Also, calcitonin. Um, the um, elevated calcium in the blood, okay, so if you get a lot of calcium floating around the blood, calcitonin is going to reduce that. You're going to take that blood calcium and put it into the bones, um, help it get excreted from the kidneys, because you don't want too high levels of blood, uh, of calcium in the blood. So it's going to help bring that back down to normal. Some disorders of the thyroid, um, maybe you or someone you know has um, thyroid issues. Um, the thyroid can, a lot of times we say it's either overactive or underactive thyroid. Um, a hyperthyroid would be that overactive thyroid um, where you have a high metabolic rate. Um, some other of the symptoms of hyperthyroidism would be sensitive to heat, restless, weight loss, protruding eyes, um, some of those types of things. Another type of overactive thyroid is Graves' disease, and that's an autoimmune disease where antibodies from the patient's own body start to attack the thyroid. They will bind to um, receptors on the thyroid cell, and the antibodies basically pretend to be TSH, and so um, those antibodies are um, in a sense stimulating the thyroid so it will produce too much T3, T4. Okay, so instead of TSH binding, the antibodies are binding in addition to some TSH probably and making that thyroid work over time. Hypothyroidism would be underactive thyroid and one example of that is Hashimoto's disease and it is also an anti or an autoimmune disorder where the antibodies are going to actually attack and destroy cells of the thyroid. So this, the thyroid cells can't produce T3, T4. Um, and then there's also infantile and so babies you know, th hyper th hypothyroidism found in babies, um, and then also in adults. And these are going to both, if the T3, T4 isn't produced in sufficient amounts, then glucose metabolism, other carbohydrate <clears throat> metabolism is going to slow down. It's going to have stunted growth, low metabolic rates, 
They're gonna be sub, uh, sluggish, have a poor appetite and things like that. And then there's a goiter, which is basically the thyroid isn't functioning because a person has a, uh, a deficiency in iodine. We don't typically see that in um, more developed countries, um, but in less developed countries, if a person doesn't have um, an adequate iodine intake um, as a nutrient, then um, the thyroid may not work as well and cause hypothyroidism. So here's some pictures of those. Okay, so that's a thyroid. Um, make sure you know the three hormones that we talked about there. And then here is the parathyroid. Okay, so if we take, let me back up here. We take this image, okay, we're looking at this anteriorly. So this is in the front of the throat, okay? If we take that, get my hand in front of here, and we flip it around, and we look on the back side, back here, we're going to see the parathyroid. So if we look towards the backbone, okay, the trachea, remember, sits in front of the esophagus. Here's the throat or the pharynx here with the blood vessels coming up. Here's the aortic arch. Trachea, esophagus will flow back there behind the aortic arch. Um, so if we look at the posterior view, the back view of the thyroid, we'll see the four parathyroid glands, okay? There are four glands there. So we have this light colored area here and here, that's the back side of the thyroid. And then these pinkish little dots here, those are the parathyroid glands. They only secrete one hormone, and that's called parathyroid hormone, okay? And parathyroid hormone is going to also regulate calcium and phosphate concentrations in the blood. Um, so if you get um, low blood calcium, okay, maybe you don't have enough calcium floating around in your blood, parathyroid hormone will help release some of that calcium to get blood calcium levels back up to where they should be. Calcitonin brought blood calcium levels down. Parathyroid hormone or PTH is going to bring them back up. Okay. Um, and it's going to also decrease the phosphate levels in the blood. Okay. So parathyroid hormone is going to work on the kidneys, the liver, and then also the intestines. Can you think why we would need um, an effect on the, on the intestines? Right, so you could absorb calcium from cheeses or other foods um, to get that calcium back into the blood out of the digestive system a little bit more efficiently. Um, let's see. Parathyroid hormone also works on the kidney, which helps, um, let's see, reabsorb calcium back to the blood from the kidneys instead of excreting it in the urine. Um, let's see. It also works with the liver to do some chemical reactions that um, ultimately activate vitamin D, which is also going to stimulate calcium absorption of food, from food back into the, uh, back into the bloodstream. Okay, so this is just another way of showing it. Parathyroid um, is stimulated to start releasing parathyroid hormone because there's a decrease in blood calcium. Hormone goes through the bloodstream. The bones are going to start to release a little bit of calcium. Kidneys are going to reabsorb calcium back into the blood, and then the intestines are going to absorb um, calcium if it's available in the diet back into the blood as well. And then as the blood calcium concentrations increase, we get that negative feedback and that's going to tell the parathyroid hormone to, or parathyroid to stop producing as much hormone. Okay, now I have one of the videos that you guys are going to watch 
is basically a video on the parathyroid gland and some disorders of the parathyroid. Um, so make sure you check that one out. Um, I think it's kind of a neat video. Um, it's designed for people going in to have parathyroid surgery um, to kind of as an educational um, video to kind of educate them on what's going to happen in their surgery. But I think it's very informational just to give you um, a little bit more information about the parathyroid because that's not something that we won't normally commonly think of as an endocrine gland. Um, so I'm going to let the video tell you a little bit more about hyper and hypo parathyroidism. Okay, next structure is going to be the um, adrenal glands. We've already talked about those just a little bit in the urinary system. Um, the adrenal glands, remember, they sit right on top of the kidney. So we have our kidney here and the adrenal glands sit right up here. Sometimes they're also called the suprarenal gland because they sit up top and superior means above. Um, well, let's see, they're going to secrete hormones from different areas of the, of the adrenal gland. And just like the kidneys, they have an, a medulla and a cortex. And here's some of the hormones. We're not going to go through all of the hormones that the adrenal glands produce, but we're going to talk about some of them. Um, here's the adrenal gland. And if you can imagine the kidney sitting down underneath there, um, we have the adrenal, we have a capsule, just like the kidney. And then you have the adrenal cortex, which is this lighter color here. And then the adrenal medulla is the darker color on the inside. Okay, so just like the kidney, there's a capsule, there's a cortex, and there's a medulla. Now there's no renal pelvis or anything like that, but there is a cortex and the medulla. And if you look at it in the microscope, here's the capsule, cortex area, and then the part of the medulla is broken off. And we'll talk about chromaffin cells here in just a minute. Um, but the adrenal cortex is, let me get to my page. a group of cells or part of the gland that produces steroid hormones. Um, we'll talk about those here in just a second. The adrenal medulla produces amine hormones. Do you guys remember what the amine hormones were? Um, the epinephrine and norepinephrine or adrenaline and noradrenaline, those are the amine hormones. Okay, so the adrenal medulla is gonna secrete two hormones those two amine hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, or also called adrenaline and noradrenaline. Most of what the adrenal medulla produces is going to be epinephrine, 80%, 20% approximately is going to be the norepinephrine, okay? And it's the chromaffin cells that produce these hormones. That's where they come from. And they're going to cause, these are called catecholamines, and they're going to cause the fight or flight response. Okay, um, so here is the effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine. And these are two de that you'll definitely wanna know for the test and where they're produced, the adrenal medulla. Okay, so epinephrine, let's talk about that one. Um, it's going to increase heart rate and increase the force of contraction. Okay, so is norepinephrine. Epinephrine is going to cause vasodilation and important skeletal muscles. So, right, if you um, have the fight or flight response because you ran out in front of a semi on accident, you're a pedestrian walking along, and oh my gosh, you need to have your leg muscles move really fast, right? So you're going to have a lot more blood flow, bringing nutrients and oxygen to those leg muscles so you can go really fast, okay? Norepinephrine, though, is going to cause vasoconstriction. So as you're trying to run out of the way of the semi, you don't need to be having blood in your viscera, like in your intestine, right? You can get by with a little bit less blood there, because um, you don't have to necessarily digest your breakfast in that moment. So the body is really kind of neat when you have that fight or flight response. 
it actually constricts blood vessels around the skin and other quote unquote non-essential areas in the body. Um, so it can get more, more blood shunted over to the brain and to the heart and to the lungs and skeletal muscle. Okay, and so epinephrine is going to cause vasodilation in those important muscles and norepinephrine is going to cause vasoconstriction in other areas of the body. So you, you can fight if you have to or flee if you have to. Blood pressure increases just a little bit with those. Um, airways are dilated with epinephrine. Um, reticular formation, part of your brain is activated with epinephrine. Uh, epinephrine is going to also cause glucose being stored in the liver to be broken down from glycogen. So glycogen is a molecule that um, is, excess glucose is stored as in the liver. And so um, to really power those cells to get you out of the way or, or whatever, um, that will be converted, glycogen will be converted back to glucose so you can get the glucose to the cells that need it. Um, and then they'll both increase the metabolic rate um, that's happening in the body. Okay, so that's kind of a quick rundown of the fight or flight response. Um, <coughs> in the um, hormones produced by the adrenal medulla. The adrenal cortex um, is gonna produce some steroid hormones like cortisol, aldosterone, we've talked about that one, and some sex horm hormones like um, supplemental testosterone. Um, and also uh, androgens are examples there. Um, we have already talked about aldosterone. It's going to help regulate blood pressure and also sodium and potassium ions um, being conserved or released in the urine. Um, cortisol, that's our stress hormone. We'll talk about stress here in just a little bit. It's going to decrease protein synthesis, de decrease protein production in the body, increase fatty acid release from the liver and other places, and then stimulate glucose synthesis from other non-carbohydrates like proteins and fatty acids. Um, and then androgens kind of supplement um, the reproductive organs when necessary. <coughs> <coughs> there are three regions to the um, renal, adrenal cortex, um, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. Um, the outer zone, zona glomerulosa, is going to produce aldosterone and mineral corticoids. And that would be like um, hormones that help also with con conservation of sodium, potassium, and other mineral, quote unquote, minerals in the body. Um, the middle zone is going to produce those cortisol stress hormones or glucocorticoids. If you think of cortisone, okay, maybe you've heard of that before. Um, that is produced in this middle area of the adrenal cortex. And then the zona reticularis, this lower area here, is going to produce those sex hormones like testosterone and the androgens that we talked about. And then here's the chromaffin cells that produce epi and norepinephrine. Okay, so this is gonna, this is where we cut off. Up here's the cortex, down here is the medulla. Um, we've already talked about the angiotensin, renin-angiotensin system. Um, just to kind of remind you, if you have a decrease in blood pressure, the kidneys will release um, the hormone renin or the enzyme renin, which basically causes a chemical reaction in the blood, um, which tells the um, adrenal cortex to reduce or uh, excrete aldosterone. That's going to help conserve water because of the sodium ion concentration that is reserved. And that reserve is basically increasing volume, which can increase blood pressure. 
um, cortisol secretion. Okay, again, that has to do with glucose metabolism. Um, hypothalamus releases corticotropic releasing hormone, sends that message to the anterior pituitary. ACTH is a hormone that's released into the blood, travels to the adrenal cortex. It releases the hormone cortisol back to the blood, and that's going to stimulate glucose production from fatty acids or proteins and other, um, other nutrients. And then um, those effects will then cause negative feedback to turn down the system. Okay, I'm going to skip this one. Your book talks about some of the sex hormones like estrogen and so forth in this chapter. We're going to skip them and talk about them when we get to the reproductive chapter, which is the next unit. Okay, um, the pancreas. So we've already talked about the pancreas, right, in the digestive system. And remember, the pancreas sits right up behind the stomach. And we said during the digestive system that it has two functions. It serves as an endocrine gland and also as an exocrine gland. And in the digestive system, oops, come back. We remember that the pancreas is super important to produce digestive enzymes so our body can break down the foods we eat and get the nutrients from them absorbed into the bloodstream. Okay, the endocrine system obviously is going to produce some hormones. We'll talk about those. Um, there are three hormones and um, definitely want to know about insulin, okay? Insulin is secreted from special cells in the pancreas called beta cells. And um, those cells in the pancreas are called isolates, um, the isolates of the pancreas. And so the beta isolate cells are going to produce insulin when necessary and alpha cells alpha isolate cells are going to produce the hormone glucagon and then the delta cells are going to produce a hormone called somatostatin okay so definitely no somatostatin um, okay but definitely no insulin and definitely no glucagon for the test okay so this remember this is the pancreas we saw it before here's a small intestine um, the gallbladder the liver would be up here there's a duct that comes through here from the gallbladder into the duodenum. And then there's also a duct that the pancreatic duct that comes in here and delivers into the duodenum. That's the exocrine function of the pancreas. Okay, but we're gonna focus on the endocrine function. Um, here's the pancreatic isolates. Also, those are called isolates of Langerhans. Um, and here, if we zoom in, Okay, we have the duct that's going to take those digestive juices out. And these cells here are going to produce those digestive cells in the exocrine uh, function. In the isolates here, these other pink cells, those are going to produce hormones, and those hormones are going to enter the bloodstream. Okay. So here's the three hormones, okay? And again, make sure that you remember what they do. So say you eat a meal and you have um, a Mountain Dew and a donut for your meal, okay? Real healthy, right? Um, your blood glucose is gonna go up. After you've ingested your meal, your digestive system's gonna break that donut down. It's gonna start um, absorbing nutrients, sugars, basically from those two items that you've eaten or consumed. So your blood glucose levels are going to get higher, right? Because you're getting more glucose flowing around in your blood. So insulin is gonna be released from those beta cells in the pancreas in response to that high glucose level. And insulin is going to try to pull glucose from the blood, okay? Because if you have too much glucose floating around in your blood um, for long periods of time, like for years, if a person has uncontrolled like diabetes, we'll talk about that, um, that can be very damaging to kidneys, 
eyes, a lot of different body structures. So remember, we have to maintain homeostasis in the body. So insulin pulls the extra glucose out of the blood and gets rid of it by converting that glucose into glycogen, which is stored in the liver. It stops the conversion of like amino acids and fatty acids and other non-carbohydrates. It stops that from being turned into glucose, right? Because we already have so much glucose. We don't need any more. We don't need protein being turned into glucose, broken down metabolically and turned into glucose. Um, Insulin is going to enhance glucose going into cells of fat and muscle. And... Um, so the muscle cells will be able to take up that glucose more efficiently during insulin um, release. And also extra uh, glucose can go and be stored in the fat cells as well. Okay, so if you have a high diet in carbohydrates, um, people try to tend to gain weight more because insulin is telling their, mus their uh, adipose cells to take up more and more glucose and store it as fat. Okay, now if a person uh, maybe hasn't eaten for a considerable, considerable amount of time and the blood glucose level is very low, the alpha cells will start to secrete glucagon and that will help bring the blood glucose level back up, back to homeostasis. So glucagon and insulin are kind of like opposites, okay? Insulin decreases blood glucose, takes glucose out of the blood. Glucagon puts glucose back into the blood. So if the person isn't um, consuming carbohydrates, okay, and their blood glucose level, level drops, glucagon tells the liver, okay, hey, take glycogen, take fatty acids, take these other non-carbohydrate, molecules and turn them into glucose and also maybe start breaking down some adipose tissue and release those products into the blood to raise blood glucose back to where it should be okay and then somatostatin so make sure you know insulin and glucagon okay and their properties and then somatostatin kind of helps turn off insulin and glucose or glucagon, okay? So um, I've had students kind of get these terms mixed up a little bit, okay? So glucagon is the hormone, glycogen is the storage form of glucose, okay? If you wanna jot that down. Glycogen is how glucose is stored in the liver. Okay, glucagon is the hormone, glycogen is stored glucose in the liver. Okay, so here's our negative feedback system, and this is happening all the time in our bodies to maintain homeostasis. Okay, so say you eat a meal and your blood glucose levels go up. Beta receptors in the pancreas is going to detect that increase in blood glucose levels. Those beta cells are going to secrete insulin, and insulin coursing through the bloodstream is going to promote glucose movement into certain cells like muscle cells and adipose cells or fat cells, and then also stimulate the formation of glycogen from glucose. So glucose is going to turn into glycogen, and that's going to be um, oops, stored in the liver for use a little bit later. Okay, so all of those extra glucose molecules are hopefully pulled from the blood, put into muscle, or stored as glycogen in the liver, and that will bring our blood glucose levels back down. Okay, then you go, you know, 12 hours without eating, and your blood glucose level gets too low. Alpha receptors in the pancreas are going to detect that. They're going to secrete the hormone glucagon. Glucagon is going to tell the liver, hey, turn that glycogen back into glucose, release that. Um, and if you have a really big shortage of glucose in the blood, it'll start taking proteins and fatty acids and turning those into glucose, releasing all of this 
to the blood and blood glucose levels will rise back toward normal, back toward homeostasis, okay? So I said insulin and glucon, glucagon are opposites and a kind of a scientific word for that would be that they are antagonistic, okay? They kind of work against each other. Um, and again, we saw negative feedback occurring here. Okay, now the case study that you guys are going to do in uh, lieu of a lab today is based on um, a patient with diabetes, okay? And so I'm gonna show you a couple of slides about diabetes, but in order to do the case study, you may have to actually go out and do some extra research to answer the questions properly, and that's okay, because I want you guys to um, try to dig into and try to figure out um, what's going on with this patient, because this is something that you'll maybe have to do in real life if you go into healthcare. Okay, so there's different types of diabetes. There's diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus. Um, we're going to talk about diabetes mellitus here. Um, and that is uh, a metabolic disease. Oops, go back. Sorry. It's a metabolic disease. And it comes from two, one of two um, situations where there's a lack of insulin produced by the pancreas or the inability of body cells to recognize insulin. And we'll talk about the differences there here in a moment. Um, but like I mentioned, prolonged elevated blood glucose can damage your eyes, your kidneys, your nerves, your heart. It's really hard on the body. So maintaining glucose levels at homeostasis is important, okay? Um, let's see, in, in, insulin, as we saw, promotes glucose uptake by fat and muscle cells. And when there's diabetes mellitus, carbohydrates like glucose can't enter the cells in normal quantities. So the glucose remains in the blood, right? Instead of the cells that need glucose, like muscles or adipose, um, they're not able to take up the glucose and pull it out of the bloodstream. So the glucose stays in the bloodstream and then causes problems. So this is called hyperglycemia, okay? It means your blood glucose level is too high, okay? Cells then, since the cells can't take up the glucose and it's stuck in the bloodstream, cells then turn to other sources of energy like fatty acids, or amino acids, which come from proteins, okay? And that's going to cause a decrease in weight, um, increase in hunger, because you're consuming food, but your body's not able to use those nutrients and energy that you're consuming. Um, you get tired, have fatigue, wounds don't heal, children don't grow, um, and causes a lot of problems. One other thing we've talked about diabetes literally means sweet smelling urine. Um, we talked about how there are receptors that um, pump glucose back into the blood from the nephron tubule in the kidney. Okay, so we have a receptor here, receptors here um, that are pumping glucose back into the blood. Well, if we have so much glucose in the urine, all of these pumps are overwhelmed, so the excess glucose will be spilled in the urine, and the urine will smell sweet. Um, and also, because there's so much glucose in there, water will follow that, causing dehydration of the patient, okay? Water's gonna follow that glucose, because it's a solute. Um, so you'll have an increase in urine volume because of that extra glucose, and that will lead to dehydration and thirst. Okay, so there's two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, diabetes mellitus. Um, this is also called juvenile diabetes, or sometimes you may have heard it called insulin-dependent diabetes, and usually this is diagnosed um, 
before adulthood in young people. And diabetes type one is an autoimmune disease where the immune system is destroying beta cells of the pancreas. And we remember that beta cells produce insulin. And so there is a lack of insulin production. So patients with type one diabetes cannot produce enough insulin. And so they will have to take supplemental insulin either through a pump or injections and, and so forth. Um, five to 10% of cases of diabetes mellitus are type one. Type two diabetes mellitus is non-insulin dependent. Okay, and this is maturity onset. Usually this comes um, well into adulthood and it's the majority of cases of diabetes mellitus. And this is when the patient produces enough insulin. Okay, there's enough insulin produced by the patient, but their body cells just don't recognize it. Okay, so a lot of times when you think of people with type two diabetes, they've had diets high in carbohydrates. Maybe not high in sugars, but high in other carbohy carbohydrates like flour, um, bread, those kinds of things. Okay, because remember, starches, are big long glucose chains and the digestive system breaks down those big starches into little individual glucose molecules. And so um, they've had so much insulin coursing around their blood that the cells don't listen to it anymore. It's kind of like nagging, okay? Well, if someone nags you all the time, you quit listening to them, okay? Same thing happening in the body. Insulin's been nagging the cells all the time and they just start ignoring insulin. Um, it's milder, okay, in form compared to type 1 diabetes, um, but prolonged problems, and if it's uncontrolled, um, could or prolonged um, uncontrolled diabetes type 2 could result in heart disease, um, damaging your eyes, um, issues with the feet, nerves, neuropathy in the feet, things like that. Um, so treatment, type 1 type diabetes, we talked about that, it requires administration of insulin. Um, back early in the 19, 19th century um, and before, if a person had type 1 diabetes, their life ex expectancy was only to about 20 years old um, because they didn't have ways to collect insulin from um, other living organisms and distribute it to those patients. So they only lived to be about 20 years old. Then in the 1920s or 30s, if I remember correctly, early kind of first part of the 19th, uh, 1900s, um, they started uh, isolating insulin from pigs and cattle and also cadavers, people that had passed away, um, and cleaning that up and giving it to um, type 1 diabetes patients, and that increased their lifespan. Now, a lot of the insulin that's produced is produced by genetically engineered bacteria, and so it's made using biotechnology. Um, and like I mentioned, insulin can be given through an injection, a pump, or even an aerosol, and there's some countries working on a skin patch that can um, be absorbed through the skin. That's called a transdermal delivery system. Through trans means through the skin. Um, and then type 2 diabetes um, can be controlled by diet, changing your diet, eating low, carb, no, low amounts of carbohydrates, exercising, and perhaps having some surgery. Okay, so there's some information that you can use to um, answer some of the questions on that case study. I'll show you that here when we get done with the lecture. Um, but again, you might have to look up some things on your own um, to, to fully answer the questions, okay? And there might be some things that you need to look back in the urinary system too um, to get those questions answered. Okay, so we of course aren't going to cover every single endocrine gland, um, but here's just a list of a few of the others. Um, the pineal gland is it, or sometimes called the pineal gland, is found in the brain, and it helps with um, secretion of melatonin, which you probably know um, is involved with um, sleep and um, circadian rhythms, like daytime rhythms, wake and sleep rhythms. Um, the thymus is located in the chest. And we talked a little bit about the thymus during our uh, immune system chapter. Thymus is where T cells, 
T lymphocytes, those white blood cells are produced, or I'm sorry, not produced, they mature there. And the thymus helps with immunity, keeping the body safe. Uh, reproductive organs, the ovaries, placenta, um, testes, we'll talk about those when we get to the reproductive chapter. And then the heart, the kidney, um, and even some other organs also um, serve as endocrine secreting systems. Um, calcitonin and renin is something that we've seen from the kidneys. Okay, now there's another video on stress. And I really like that video because um, it really talks about how stress affects the body and how um, the hormones associated with stress can cause some issues. And so um, anytime there is a stressor in our lives, which is a factor that can initiate a stress response, could be um, there's psychological stress. So like if you feel you're in danger or maybe someone passed away that's very close to us or we're angry about something, that's a stress, okay? Or there's physical stress. Maybe you're stuck outside and it's really, really cold and you can't get warm or you have an infection or um, you're, you have pneumonia and you can't get enough oxygen to your body. Those are physical stresses. And those stresses can really affect how our body maintains homeostasis, okay? These dangerous factors, if, if they're significant enough, can cause us to lose our homeostasis. And the hypothalamus, remember our major control center of the brain, is going to activate the systemic, or sorry, sympathetic nervous system and the adrenal hormones to try to keep the body back into homeostasis, okay? So the stressor is the thing that causes a problem, and then stress is basically the response to the stressor, okay? So make sure you understand those definitions there. Um, so the stress response is called the general adaptation or general stress syndrome, and it has two stages initially. Okay, so the first stage is the alarm stage. It's something that happens immediate. We gave the example of trying to cross the street and you almost get hit by a car. Okay, that's that fight or flight response. Um, sympathetic impulses from the nervous system are gonna be involved and also the hormone epinephrine. Okay, so we talked a little bit about epinephrine and what it does to the blood uh, or I'm sorry, to the heart and to um, blood vessels and, and so forth. But there's sympathetic nerve impulses also that are going to help with heart and breathing rate, um, shunting blood to the skeletal muscles away from digestion and so forth to those critical responses, okay? Then there's resistance stage, okay? So sometimes in our society, it's really easy to be just under stress all the time. Work, school, family, um, all of those many, many different types of things um, can cause stress. And that is when we enter the resistance stage where we're um, having long-term stress. And cortisol, that stress hormone, is going to be in um, increased numbers floating around the body. And that's going to want to spare glucose for the brain, right? Because we want the brain to be able to think and control actions and, and so forth. Um, and glucagon and growth hormone will mobilize energy from other tissues um, to send to the brain if necessary. Um, when people are under stress, they can gain weight. Uh, maybe without even changing their diet because of water retention from ADH and renin hormones from the kidneys and also releasing this energy to make sure the brain has enough fuel, okay? So if the brain's taken all it's needing and these other hormones are releasing um, energy sources, the person could um, be gaining weight from that as well. Um, so... The hypothalamus senses a stressor 
in the environment, physical or physiological or uh, psychological, the sympathetic nerve impulses are going to send norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter. Okay, and the video will really explain this well. Um, the difference between norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter and norepinephrine as a hormone. Okay, so check that out in the video. He'll do a really good job explaining that. Um, the sympathetic nerve impulses will also stimulate the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine, norepinephrine, and then we do that fight or flight or alarm stage. Okay, now if we have long term fight or flight, we start to see some other things happening as well. Uh, corticotropic releasing hormone tells the anterior pituitary, which tells the adrenal cortex to release cortisol, that stress hormone. And that's going to change our blood concentration of our nutrients. Okay, so, um, and this just walks through it as well. Um, just if you like it spelled out in steps written out like that. Okay, that's kind of the walking through here. But the video on stress and the fight or flight response, I think we'll do a really good job explaining that to you. Um, and then like a lot of our chapters, lifespan changes, you know, a lot of you will um, encounter geriatric patients or older patients. And so it's good to know how um, different body systems um, are affected by age. And so as a person gets older, endocrine glands decrease in size. Okay, so their production of their particular hormones may decrease as you get older. Um, growth hormone levels decrease, and so muscular and skeletal strength decreases generally. Um, ADH levels typically increase or go higher because the liver and the kidneys are unable to or not as efficient at uh, removing that. Calcitonin levels um, shrink, leading for uh, risk of uh, osteoporosis osteoporosis, also parathyroid can cause risk in osteoporosis. Um, insulin resistance may develop, especially if you um, are sedentary and eat a high car carbohydrate diet. Um, and then thymosin, we talked about the thymus, how it shrinks over time back when we talked about the um, lymphatic system, because the thymus is also part of the lymphatic system. Okay, and we talked about how people, um, as they get older, they could be at more at risk for infections because their immune system has been weakened as well. Okay, so I'm going to exit out of this and pull up, let's see, this diabetes case study. Okay, I just wanted to show to you, it will be posted on D2L. And here is some history information about an eight-year-old girl. This is a, um, a case study on diabetes mellitus and chronic renal failure. Okay, and so it'll ask you some questions here. It'll tell you some of her blood uh, results from her labs and ask you some different questions. Okay, so they'd be thinking about homeostasis, thinking about the urinary system, thinking about acid-base balance. Okay, those things will help you answer these questions. Now, when you get to this question three on the last page, this is where you might have to Google what some of these um, items might mean. Okay, so um, that's that. You can type right in here on this, or you can print it out, write on it, and take a picture and send it back to me. But I want you to place it, and I don't have it set up yet. Um, if you go into assignments in D2L, I will have a submission folder here where you can upload that um, assignment, okay? Either your picture that you took or um, a PDF or, or whatever type of file, okay? So there'll be a file here for you to load that. Also, when I get this video uploaded, um, these are the four videos that you will watch and you'll get, um, it's a five-point assignment to watch each one of them, 
okay? So make sure you watch those. And then also there'll be a mastering homework for 13B, okay? So I'll get all that on the checklist and get this video posted and you will be good to go for the rest of the endocrine system. Okay, have a good weekend and we will talk to you later.